what your country can do for you. The man is the oppressor. Well, I'm not a crook. I'm the greatest. I am somebody. Read my lips. I have a dream. Good evening, I'm Ron Reagan. President John F. Kennedy used to say everyone could remember where they were when they heard the news of Pearl Harbor and the death of Franklin Roosevelt. In this half of the 20th century, it is the news of his assassination, of course, that has us all frozen somewhere back in our life, trying to grasp news that was simply too large and too bad to absorb, and still is in many ways. The death of John F. Kennedy doesn't go away. The murder resists solution. The memory won't fade, and the implications seem to grow more and more devastating even today, 28 years after the fact. We seem no closer to acceptance or understanding, but the assault continues. Norman Mailer has a fat new novel that tries to put Kennedy and the CIA in some sort of context. Oliver Stone's new movie is about the New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison and the one single criminal prosecution in connection with the case. There's a movie about Jack Ruby, a miniseries on Jackie Kennedy, a five-part cable show called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. And staring up at you from every newsstand in the country, the current issue of Esquire with a cover story on JFK. The man, the movie, the murder mystery. With us tonight, Robert Sam Anson wrote that cover story for Esquire magazine. He wrote a book about the Kennedy assassination in 1975 as well. David Lifton's book, Best Evidence, got the case into the New York Times bestseller list, and his theories on what happened to JFK's corpse after the assassination have broken important new ground. Carl Oglesby is head of the Assassination Information Bureau in Boston, and Carl is an expert on the political aspects of JFK's death. Robert Groden was the chief consultant for a recent British TV series called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. He's a professional photo analyst who's made much of the photographic evidence on the assassination. Uh, he's made it public, that is, or at least available to the public. Welcome to you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. I should, uh, David, this is your book, Best Evidence, and, uh, and Robert, high treason from you, and that takes care of the book plugs for the evening. <laughs> all right, let's... Uh, Let's start with the event itself and then sort of move out concentrically. It, it is about 12.30 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963. We're in Dallas, Texas. The president has just made a rather odd little bend in his motorcade route. He enters Dealey Plaza and shots are fired. Fortunately, there's a lot of photographic and film evidence as well as eyewitness accounts. What does that evidence tell us happened? How many shots, who was firing, that sort of thing. We've been fighting about that ever since it happened. Uh, if, uh, if only there had been a, a few more photographs, a few more films, maybe we could have pinned it down. If only there had been an autopsy in Dallas uh, instead of the removal of the body under certain peculiar circumstances to Washington. Uh, but the fact is that for all the eyewitnesses, for all the photographic and other kinds of evidence, it's still a mystery as to what happens. Of course, the government says that there were three shots fired, one of them missed, one of them hit both the president and Governor Connolly, the so-called single, single bullet or magic bullet theory. And then a third shot uh, hit Kennedy in the head and uh, clearly was fatal. Mm -hmm. Look, it's the central thesis of my book and uh, central to what I think happened, that President Kennedy's body was secretly altered between the time of the shooting at 1230 and the time of the autopsy. Okay. And it's the alterations that have confused the issue and prevented us from knowing the truth and make Oswald look guilty. Okay, I want to get law. to the autopsy in a bit, but let's yeah. just, let's stay in Dealey Plaza just for the moment. Uh, Robert, you've made a great study of the Zapruder film, the Abraham Zapruder film, which many of us have seen, and unfortunately it was too expensive for us to get a hold of for the show. <laughs> what does that seem to demonstrate about the number of shots? Mm. Well, the Zapruder film is, in fact, a clock for the assassination. Uh, it creates what I like to refer to as salami slices of time. You can tell what happens from the evaluation of the film, each frame running about an 18th of a second from the one before or after it. And given the responses of both men and uh, aligning the film with the acoustics tape that was made quite by accident by the Dallas Police Department, you end up with a, a relatively uh, accurate uh, scenario of the events. Uh, that is that more than one person was firing because the Zapruder film also shows us the spaces between the shots. And because of that, we know that the capability of Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle was not fast enough 
to have fired the shots that quickly. There had to be at least a second assassin, based on the photographic evidence alone. Mm -hmm. There is also a lot of eyewitness testimony. Do you find it compelling? The eyewitness testimony that uh, was presented to the Warren Commission, uh, two-thirds of the witnesses said that uh, the fatal shot uh, that killed the president came from the direction of the grassy knoll, the so-called grassy knoll in front of him, where the Warren Commission, the government explanation is that all the shots came from behind the president. Uh, the catch of having shots in front of the president, we know that there were some shots from behind as well, so you have ipso facto two gunmen or a conspiracy. Uh, part of a difficulty uh, with Dealey Plaza is that eyewitness testimony is not the most reliable thing in the world. Uh, people are, get emotionally charged, especially during an incident like that one. So you're looking f for what is the best evidence and what is the most cold-blooded kind of evidence. We have lots of uh, 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 photographs. That, uh, clearly, this is the most photographed assassination ever. Mm -hmm. One of the most photographed news events. One ever. of the f photographs is by a woman named Mary Moorman, and much has been made of that photograph, blown up, enhanced, what have you, that purports to show, and I'm not an expert, so I don't know, purports to show a man with a rifle, he appears to be wearing something like a police uniform at the top of the knoll. Mm -hmm. It appears to have been taken at the instant that he fired. It was mm -hmm. taken within a sixth of a second of the shooting. Uh, right now it is being analyzed outside of the country. We've tried to have it analyzed within the United States, and every time someone's gotten close to finishing an analysis, they get afraid of it. They run away from it, refuse to give a report, return the originals, and that's it. Whether the, uh, the gentleman who appears to be in the photograph is really there or whether it's light or shadow, it's still, after 28 years, too soon to say. Uh, the, uh, the evolution of computer analysis of photographs is now reaching a point where we may be able to do something with it. Maybe one of the problems, I, it, there is a tendency to get too hung up in what happened in Dealey Plaza, uh, to spend too much time speculating on how many gunmen were there, what kind of weapons were they using, uh, what, when were the shots fired. The fact of the matter we're is... We're only spending one segment on the, the fact of the matter <laughs> is that the, uh, the evidence that there was more than one gunman is overwhelming. And I think that you've got to get beyond the realm of Dealey Plaza mm -hmm. to find out what was the motivation? We're, we're heading that way. I, I just want to mention one more thing before we go to a break, and that, that's the evidence that, that seems to be suggested by physics. If you watch the Zapruder film, at the instant the president is hit in the head, his head snaps backward. Well, that's, the, that's where my starting off point was in this whole case. Back in 1965, the 26 volumes were available. We did not have the Zapruder film in color or in motion. And when you look on the page of those volumes, and of course it's the same thing is true in the film itself, the head after the fatal shot goes back violently and to the left. And I don't see how it's possible to argue that the president can be propelled backwards by a shot from behind. Okay. That was the my calculated point. rate of acceleration, by the way, was 100.3 feet per second per second. Far faster than a neuromuscular reaction. Uh, the excuse that the so-called other side presents all the time is the car was accelerating. Well, in fact, it was decelerating. Mm -hmm. You can see from the Knicks film from the other side of the street that the motorcycle policemen actually almost overtake it. The mm -hmm. car is slowing down, so that's not an excuse. Okay, we have to take a break now, but when we return, we'll deal with the question of Lee Harvey Oswald in a minute. To buy it, Sears. Is people's year-end double okay. issue. Anita Hill. The 25 Bush, most intriguing John, people of Madonna, 1991. Taylor, Mick Jagger, All in people's year-end double issue, Tom starring Cruz, the 25 Prince most William, intriguing Michael people. Jackson, Brooke Shields. Do John Fitzgerald Kennedy do solemnly swear? I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. We're back discussing the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The Warren Commission, of course, blames Lee Harvey Oswald. He was a lone gunman, a fanatic, what have you. He's a somewhat mysterious figure. What do we know about him? We wouldn't know much about him from reading the Warren Commission report. Uh, the Warren Commission alleged that uh, Oswald shot and killed the president acting alone with no outside encouragement or assistance. Uh, according to the Warren Commission, he was a deranged uh, stock boy who wanted to make a, a name for himself. The fact of the matter is that that there was, has been convincing testimony both before the, the Warren Commission and since that the buffs have dug up that Lee Oswald had enjoyed extensive ties to U.S. intelligence. Um, from the time he was 
in the Marine Corps, which has signed him to a top secret CIA base in the Far East, to his so-called defection to the Soviet Union, which was, what, 59? Yeah. Um, uh, to his return uh, to the United States. Um, he's been in and out of the company of uh, people who have clearly have, organ or not organized, but clearly have intelligence fingerprints all over them. Mm -hmm. That sound, you know, sound good to you guys? Yes, it's very important also to know about Oswald that there was uh, a, a concerted effort starting already in 1960 to, uh, to double him. There are at least uh, half a dozen well-documented insta instances on the record starting the earliest in 1960 when he's in the Soviet Union, presumably a defector, in which somebody who could not possibly have been Lee Harvey Oswald was calling himself Lee Harvey Oswald. And these incidences come right up to a few days before the assassination. So th this, is, this guy is a very mysterious figure. He is not by any means the, the solitary, reclusive uh, nut uh, that the Warren Commission wanted uh, us to think he was. And the peculiar thing beyond this is that the Warren Commission very well had this information available to it, very well knew that this was not a lone nut. This was a guy with, with important connections to the intelligence world. Mm -hmm. Indeed, he had a higher security clearance than his own commanding officer when he was stationed at Itsugi Air Base in Japan. And uh, he had uh, a great deal of knowledge of the U-2 spy flights, and this is what he uh, was purporting to give to the Soviets when he defected. Mm -hmm. So this was not some dumb lone nut dropout as we're presented with. It should be, I think, noted as well that this is not something that the buffs, the assassination buffs, have dreamed up. If you take a look at the declassified transcripts of the Warren Commission's executive sessions, they were just as worried as the people who were sitting here are that, that Lee Oswald had connections to American intelligence. Mm -hmm. They were very, very bothered by what he was up to in the Soviet Union, by the fact that he came returned from the Soviet Union after his so-called defection. And this was at a time when the CIA was interviewing tourists coming home from Yugoslavia. And with this fellow, who uh, had offered to commit espionage on behalf of the Soviets, just passed blissfully back into his country with no problem uh -huh. whatsoever. I mean, there are lots of those things in the background. One thing he doesn't Commission seem to have been is a particularly good marksman, if I'm reading the research correctly, although that was central to the Warren Commission's thesis, that That's he was right. actually an expert marksman. Nelson Delgado said that when he uh, was at the rifle range, they would run up the red flag because he'd missed the target completely. They call that Maggie's drawers. Mm -hmm. And he got a lot of Maggie's drawers. The red flag was going up a lot. Something with, like that, yeah. Uh, the Warren Commission made so much of the fact that he was classified as a marksman. Marksman is the lowest acceptable classification you can get than sharpshooter and expert. Mm -hmm. uh, just barely making marksman doesn't make you a good shot. When, uh, when I was in the service, there were a lot of people that could not score very well, and just to get the day over with, they would give them marksman status. Mm -hmm. And the fact um, is, you know, a lot of uh, experts have tried to duplicate Oswald's alleged feat of getting two shots on a moving target at the range of, of about a football field's distance and nobody has ever been able to do it, even against stationary targets. Mm -hmm. He was firing a rather outmoded gun. Absolutely. A man liquor, Cumbersome. Uh, carbine, I believe yeah. it was, a single yeah. shot. It was, an, it was an Italian army uh, weapon, and the Italians who used it during World War II called it the humanitarian rifle. Because he couldn't kill anybody with it on it purpose. It was never known to hurt anyone on purpose. Yeah. Well, was Oswald a patsy, as he at one point claimed in an in a interview sort of passing through the Dallas Well, I, I believe he's a complete patsy. And that means, I believe, that if you sat down with him for a cup of coffee on the morning of November 22nd, 1963, and if we could get into a time machine and speak to him and find out, he would have a story to explain his impressions of who he was and what he's doing in that building. And I believe that when he put his head on the pillow on the night of November 21st, he hasn't the faintest idea that President Kennedy is going to get shot at or anything like that on November 22nd. So clearly in Oswald's life, there's some force some story he's believing that permits him to be moved around in the 18 months before the shooting to all these different cities. He has post office boxes. He makes a trip out of the country to Mexico. Never wants to give his brother his address. Things of that sort are going on. Mm -hmm. There were certain timing problems with his whereabouts on the day. 90 seconds after the shooting, estimate by a police officer who ran into the book depository building, encountered Oswald sipping a Coke on the second floor. That is a very serious incident because the officer runs into the building. If you see films of it, he dismounts, runs right into the building, and he wants to go upstairs, but between the second and the third floor, he's no longer following the building manager who's leading him upstairs. And the building manager comes back to the second floor landing, and there's Oswald at the coke inside a room with a coke in his hand, and the officer has his gun out up against his stomach. And the line I use in lectures is, what was the officer supposed to say? Drop the coke or I'll shoot? <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is that within 90 seconds of the shooting at most, and possibly within 20 seconds of the shooting, a man who 
could have shot Lee Harvey Oswald ended up being his alibi witness for all of those of us who believe he's innocent. He places him definitively on the second floor of the building. All right, when we return, we'll deal with some of the very curious goings-on around the autopsy of John F. Kennedy when we come back. We've had intelligence. You could finish your father's work. You're as brilliant as he was. He inherited his father's dreams. I'm talking about this. Sons, guaranteed lowest prices are lower than ever. You'll find huge savings in every department during this year-end update now. Starting Thursday, give your home a great new look for the new year during our fabulous $6 million white sale at Value City. Part of a $1.3 million buyout. Famous maker Thermoplank. <laughs> With our discussion of the JFK assassination, all right, the shooting has happened. JFK is now taken to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. He has a massive head wound. He has a wound in his throat, perhaps a wound in his back. What do the doctors that first get to him see? What do they describe? They describe a wound at the front of the throat, a thought to be a bullet's entry. They see basically two holes. He's lying on his back face up. They see a hole in the side of the necktie knot. They see another hole in the right rear of the head. They think the hole in the necktie knot's an entry. They think the one in the right rear is an exit. And they speculate among themselves at the time and in the day following that either a bullet went in here and lodged in the lung and another bullet entered somewhere on the head and blew out the rear. Or maybe one bullet entered here, climbed the spinal column somehow. We know this didn't happen because of the Zabruder film, and blew out the back of the head. The film shows us there's two separate events, that these wounds are unrelated. They're not the same bullet. And that's what they thought. The body does not look that way at the time it arrives at, par at uh, Bethesda that night and when the autopsy is performed. Uh, this wound, I can talk about the changes if you want to talk about the changes. Okay, let's take a look. I, I'm no expert, but I've, I've seen the photographs, the drawings, the x-rays, and nothing seems to match. Mm -hmm. The x-rays don't match the pictures, don't match the drawings. We've got, a, we've got some over here. Maybe you can sort of comment. Uh, okay. Anybody just jump in. All right, this, hey, is, this a, is what purports to be the, the wound coming through the back of the neck and, and a photograph. In the upper left you have there an uh, insert there showing the Warren Commission view of the neck trajectory in the back of the neck, out the front of the neck. And the autopsy photograph on the right showing the little wound uh, at point one there that no one saw at Parkland Memorial Hospital. And one of the doctors actually ran his hands up the back and he said when questioned that he didn't know about any wound. Mm -hmm. Now nine years later someone's come forward and said, oh, I you know, was told about this wound. But the bottom line is that that's the neck trajectory, and at Dallas, they thought it entered from the front. At Bethesda, uh, they thought it entered from the rear. And regarding that wound number one, the Dallas doctor who did the tracheotomy, Dr. Perry, um, received a call from Commander Humes the morning after the assassination, and he was asked by Humes, did you make any wounds in the back? Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact of the record. And he was very confused by the call and was amazed that the doctor in that Bethesda said to him that the, there was nothing left of the throat wound. All right, this is the x-ray, purports to be the x-ray on the left, and the actual head wound, out of deference to the president, we've blanked out his face, uh, photograph from the autopsy. They don't seem to be the same thing. They're not. The, wo the wound in the x-ray shows a great deal of damage into the right orbit in the area in front of the, uh, of, uh, just above the eye. The uh, photograph, however, shows no damage there at all. Not only do the wounds in the x-ray and the photographs not match each other, but neither of them match what any of the doctors saw. Mm -hmm. uh, what was said before is absolutely true. The doctors all described, every single one of them, a large exit wound in the rear of the president's head. They said it on the day of the assassination, and they're saying it now. The photographs and x-rays do not match each other. Something is clearly wrong. And the drawings clearly Just don't... Uh, one one yes. more detail about on the, when the Assassinations Committee of the U.S. Congress looked at this stuff in 1977-78, they, they made a final report acting as if they thought there was a big hole in the front right of the president's mm -hmm. head. And nobody saw anything like that in 1963. 
This is a this is drawing a on the right of, uh, of the, uh, the president's head, the, the photograph on the left, uh, they clearly don't match. Well, well, the problem there is, and this is, I, I remember I made a discovery just like this, and this, what happened here was, you have the docs drawing on the right showing a clearly delineated entry wound at the rear of the head, and yet the photograph in the same area doesn't show the wound. And if there was a new investigation, I'd sure like to find out why the artist drew in a wound, in effect, that was practically in italics mm -hmm. when the well, photograph doesn't show. Okay. What we have but, here is uh, the area they're calling a wound. There is no definition to it. There's no depth and there's no margin. There's hair growing out of it. All yeah. it is is a piece of dried blood. Um, what happens to the president's body? He leaves Parkland in a bronze casket. He's loaded onto Air Force One, ends up in Washington, D.C. now. Happen He's, what happens then? Well, what happens then is the president's body is brought to Parkland Memorial Hospital. You want to talk about the after, evidence after Dallas. of the intercept? Now it's leaving Dallas. It's now on the, Air Force the One. Air, it is the president's body is put into the large casket. It's put on Air Force One. Now, then the plane makes the flight to Washington. In Washington, the coffin is offloaded off Air Force One on national television. To pick up the story of what must have happened earlier than the day, you have to go to the witnesses who received the body. Paul O'Connor in the autopsy room gets the body in a body bag. That's in the House Select Committee's report. Uh, the body was not put in a body bag in Dallas. It was put, it was wrapped in sheets. When I, uh, that report, uh, when I made that discovery at the time, my book, Best Evidence, was about to go to McMillan, and I had to stop publication of the book and go back to the record because there the House report was publishing the fact that the body arrived in a body bag, and I called up the attorney for the House Select Committee and said, did Paul O'Connor say the body was in a body bag? And he said, if I wrote body bag, he said body bag. Mm -hmm. I said, Andy, his name was Andrew Purdy, do you know what a body bag is? And he said, no, what's a body bag? And I said, where were you during the Vietnam War? I mean, that's the kind of investigation they conducted, that they had the evidence, circumstantial evidence of an intercept, and they didn't even know what it looked mm -hmm. like. Speculation seems to be that the president was, in fact, loaded off the other side of the plane and perhaps airlifted to Walter Reed Hospital Based on before the, it went to the... That's test. correct. In Best Evidence in Chapter 31, I analyzed the audio tapes and showed that the only possible explanation for why you have the body arriving at Parkland, uh, excuse me, at Bethesda Hospital in one coffin uh, but a coffin which must have been empty if the body was not, you know, was arrived in a body bag and in a different coffin was that something took place on the starboard side of the plane. And I show the radio transmissions, which I spell out in my chapter 31, how they're talking about going to Walter Reed first. Now, I personally today, in 1991, don't think they went to Walter Reed. There's some other stuff I'm working on. But the fact is that they're talking Walter Reed and they're talking about a ramp on the starboard side of the plane. And one of them says on the radio, we're going to bring the first lady off by that route. Okay, we'll pick up where we left off in a minute after this. I'm Officer Lisa Hale, Vice President of the Crime Prevention Association of Michigan. Our fight against auto theft is increasing. Every 20 seconds, a car is stolen. That's why we started a major campaign to stop auto theft. We call it Operation Lockout. It's enchanting. It's a family tradition. M&M's Holidays Chocolate Candies and Finest present the second annual... Ho the Ron Reagan Show will be right back. This is an important... Uh, there being no brain in the... Well, the comment was made that the brain was removed. But to my best knowledge, I don't remember seeing any, any saw cuts or any knife cuts. But uh, it's not saying that it couldn't have been removed. Did you question the purpose of the x-rays you were taking? Yes, I asked, I said, what's the sense of taking the x-rays if there's no, nothing there? He said, well, that's not for you to say. You go ahead and do them. We're back. The assassination of John F. Kennedy. Clearly a lot of strange stuff was going on around this autopsy. We have one more set of slides, Robert, which you reminded me that we have. Uh, we can put them up now. Uh, drawing. Yeah, very simply what this is, on the left is the drawing made for the House Assassinations Committee by Ida Dox. Uh, it purports to show the rear of the head virtually intact with the uh, added entrance wound near the cowlick area. When we were writing High Treason, we brought these, uh, these two drawings, the uh, one on the left from the House Committee and the one on the right, which was done by Dr. Robert McClellan, one of the Dallas doctors. We showed this to 18 of the medical witnesses in Dallas, and every single one of them picked the one on the right, done by Dr. McClellan, as being accurate to picking the president's head wound. And the one, uh, they all said that the one on the left was not an accurate representation. The House Assassinations Committee report that no shot struck the president from the front was based entirely on the autopsy photographs. We okay. should maybe make the technical point here uh, for people who don't know it is that entrance wounds are typically small 
And Thank exit you. wounds are big, so if you see the big hole on the back of the head, that implies the shot came from the front. Bullets tend to flatten out as they pass through a body, tearing a larger hole as they exit. And right. since they, we're they, talking about... They push a lot of mass along yes, the tip. Yes, now a shock wave, in, in a sense. Exactly. Since we're talking about bullets here, and I, I'm, I know I'm moving along at a okay, fast cool. clip, uh, let, let's touch on the single bullet theory at this point. Uh, I want to start talking about conspiracy and cover-up and the, the seeming stupidity of the Warren Commission, for lack of a better word. There was a pristine bullet found on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital, purported to be on uh, Connolly's stretcher. That was the bullet that was meant to have passed through President Kennedy, made a rather odd right turn, and then came, uh, came around again and, and struck uh, Connolly under the armpit, passed through his chest, shattered his wrist, and ended up lodged in his thigh. Exactly. Now, that bullet had not a scratch on it. Well, the thing is, with the magic bullet, if you give the nature of the known wounds, and the timing that we see in the Zapruder film, this has to be the flight path. The bullet strikes the president in the back, leaving a wound of entrance six inches below the point where it hit. It exits the throat, leaving a small, neat wound of entrance. Stops, waits in midair for 1.6 seconds, heads upward and to the right, apparently sees Governor Connolly and says, why not? <laughs> Makes a sharp, downward left-hand turn, hits Governor Connolly by the right armpit, fracturing the, the uh, fifth rib, knocking out a three-inch section, causing secondary missiles of bone to flatten and, and, uh, and, and basically almost destroy his right lung. The bullet exits the right side of his chest, leaving the size, a wound the size of an old-style silver dollar. Heading again right to left, sees Governor Connolly's wrist to the right, and again says, why not? Makes a right-hand turn, fractures the distal radius bone, one of the densest bones in Governor Connolly's body. Now it's heading out toward the grassy knoll, but then sees his left leg and makes a sharp U-turn. Yeah. Buries itself in his, left, in his left thigh where it remains until it's surgically removed hours after the single bullet's on its way back to, uh, to uh, Washington. If nothing else about the Warren Commission report is ridiculous, the single bullet theory is. And that seems to me the linchpin of the Warren Commission. If you don't believe that, yeah, it all falls. then the whole yeah. thing falls apart. And Oswald cannot have been the only assassin if he was, in fact, in the sixth floor of the School Book Depository building at all. Now, the, the, the select committee in the House tried to solve this problem by figuring out a faster way to fire the rifle. They decided if you didn't aim it, you could maybe get a shot off in something like 1.7 or 8 seconds, which is still too slow for that time interval. But it was on this assumption that, uh, well, that raises all kinds of other questions. It certainly raises a lot of questions. Who put that bullet on the stretcher, for one? It certainly wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald, who was somewhere else. Well, the point is that uh, if you have a body alteration plot, then planting ammunition in connection with a plan to alter the body makes perfect sense. If you don't have a body alteration plot, then you are playing at deuces wild because if you plant a bullet, how are you going to know it's going to fit into the pattern of the wounding? So the only way the planted bullet makes sense is the idea that you are going to create a false impact situation, that you can punch a hole and plant a bullet. But the point that Carl made during the break was that all of this sounds all technical and mechanical. The importance of all of this is that it has a political implication. And that is, once you get away from the lone assassin theory, you get into the question. The reason the commission concluded one man did this and put the puzzle together this way is that they had too many wounds and not enough ammunition. Now, once you do it any other way, you start to question the evidence. And as soon as you question the evidence, whether it's a bullet, a body, or a coffin, or anything like that, you get into who's pulling strings, who's lowering camouflage over the event at the time or within hours of the shooting. And that gets real serious. And that's why there's a direct connection between the analysis of the shooting, which evidence was falsified, and what line of authority was used to phony it. Okay. In addition to that, another bullet was, was uh, signed for at the autopsy. It was found by an admiral, handed over to the autopsist, who handed it over to the, secret, to the uh, FBI. Siebert and O'Neill, the two agents, signed for it uh, for a full missile recovered that has never been placed into evidence. So we don't know what happened to it or where from the president's body it was removed. Okay, we have to take another break right now. When we come back, conspiracy, cover-up, etc. in a minute. I'm Officer Lisa Hale, Vice President of the Crime Prevention Association of Michigan. Nobody. To those nations who would make themselves our adversary, we offer not a pledge, but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace. Remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness, and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, 
but let us never fear to negotiate. We're talking about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy with my guests from Esquire magazine, Robert Sam Anson, the author of Best Evidence, David Lipton, Lifton, sorry, an authority on the political aspects of the JFK assassination, Carl Oglesby, and photo researcher Robert Groden. It would seem, gentlemen, that we have a conspiracy here. Uh, who, why, how? Well, I think one of the key ways of getting at this is to examine the assassination just the way the ordinary homicide cops do a, a murder. Who had the motive, the means, and the opportunity to pull it off? and who had the wherewithal to cover it up. Uh, we've established, I think, fairly convincingly, but something uh, rotten was going on with the autopsy. That was conducted under US government auspices. We've also established, I think, fairly convincingly, that Oswald had a relationship with US intelligence. Does that mean that, Os that US intelligence was involved in the assassination? Not necessarily. Fact of the matter is, though, that the government is somehow involved. And it has to be involved because these are the folks who had the wherewithal to cover this thing up. So then you've got to ask yourself, why would they do it? Now, that, I think we get somehow, sometimes too hung up on the details of how this thing worked. The fact of the matter is that how many, however many people were involved, it did work. And why did they? John Kennedy certainly had plenty of enemies out there, but very few of them had the power to cover this thing up. And I th think the, well, personally, I've come to the view that the answer to this lies in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has been a myth for a long time, but nothing changed in Vietnam because of the assassination, and I think that... Mm -hmm. Carl, we're kind of wandering into your territory here. Well, we? it's everybody's territory, yes. actually, and the, the fact is that this is the part of the case that's most available to uh, ordinary information. You don't have to be an expert on uh, bullet wounds uh, to, uh, to find out that something very serious uh, changed in American foreign policy with the death of Kennedy and the advent of Johnson. Uh, Kennedy was trying to make some kind of uh, peace with Castro. He was uh, internally trying to make some kind of peace with the civil rights movement, which earned him lots of enemies in, uh, in the South in particular. Uh, the Castro uh, bit, by the way, made him uh, a target for the anti-Castro Cuban community, the exiles who had flooded into the country after the victory of the, the Cuban Revolution in 1959 and who thought that they had a supporter in Kennedy, who, who believed that they would be able ultimately to mount an invasion on uh, Castro's Cuba from the United States, overthrow Castro, and uh, reestablish the system that had existed before, the system in which the mafia had controlled the casinos and so on. And in, in, in respect to Vietnam, it seems clear that Kennedy had decided sometime in the summer of uh, 1963 that the United States simply could not invest more troops, more material, more money in the attempt to prop up a hated uh, uh, regime in the south of the country. And having tried uh, to a certain de degree to achieve certain results and having failed to achieve those results, now he was going to pull away. This made a lot of people angry with him too. There were a lot of folks who thought that we needed to fight that war in Vietnam. And it's and not just speculation. There are top secret documents that have been declassified that come from the White House, National Security Action Mem Memorandums, that confirmed that, that President Kennedy, six weeks before his death, had secretly ordered the first withdrawal of a 1,000 U.S. combat advisors from Vietnam by the end of 1963, mm -hmm. and that they were all to follow by mid-year, I believe, of 1965. Now, that happened six weeks before his death. Then, on, uh, on November 20th, 1963, 48 hours before the assassination, the military calls for a massive buildup in Vietnam at a conference in Honolulu. And on November 26th, when we have a new president in office, Lyndon Johnson, he approves escalatory steps and he cancels the withdrawal from Vietnam. Can we now, that, any now that is documented, but this is not just speculation from far out crazy paranoid people. This stuff is on black and white uh, in documents and there is no question about it. But policy was turned on its head because of the assassination. Well, well Robert, it was, it was interesting just, It was interesting that Alan Dulles, who Kennedy has fired as head of the CIA, was the head of the Warren yeah. Commission investigating well, his assassination. Well, there's no excuse that he was made a member of the, of the Warren Commission. Not, not only is this all documented, uh, Robert's being very modest here, his magazine story, in fact, breaks new ground journalistically and reveals for the first time the existence of a major study which is going to be published in January and uh, by an army officer and, about, and a PhD candidate who's probably going to get his PhD within days or weeks on this topic and the uh, book is going to be called JFK in Vietnam and Robert interviewed him extensively uh, and knows all about this and the first information from this manuscript and I'm proud to have been one of about four readers of this manuscript because the author is a close friend of mine is 
uh, John Newman, and I hope you have him on your show when his book is published. <laughs> We'd love to. Is there any evidence that the Mafia was involved in this in any way? The That's Mafia been... may have been involved, but we have to remember always that the Mafia was in a contractual relationship with the CIA in the period 1960 to 1963. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly very involved with Cuba. They wanted their casinos back. Yes, absolutely. And the CIA peculiarly had turned to the Mafia in uh, what came to be known as Operation Mongoose and wanted to use mafia hitmen to destroy Castro, Raul Castro, Carlos Rafael Rodriguez, Che Guevara, other Cuban leaders. And there is a large body of opinion that thinks that the, that the assassination team that had been prepared to blow Castro away was turned around against Kennedy himself after it became clear that Kennedy was going to put a stop to these shenanigans against Castro. Well, uh, okay. the, the i gotta, got to take okay. a break. We'll pick up where we left off in just a minute. Need a smaller upright for a small place? Get a Dirt Devil Broom Vac. Want a second vacuum upstairs? Get a Dirt Devil Broom Vac. It's the powerful upright that's small enough to use anywhere because it's a Dirt Devil. Call us now. For thousands of special values, this is the best way to buy at Sears. This Craftsman 82-piece mechanics tool set with three quick-release ratchets in a case. Made in America, guaranteed forever. Over $100 value is just $59.99. Hurry, Sears' best week to buy ends soon. We're back with our discussion of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, Jack Ruby, Oswald's murderer, is an, is an odd figure in all this. Where does he fit in? He's absolutely crucial. If Ruby hadn't bumped Oswald off uh, two days after Dealey Plaza, uh, Oswald would have uh, had the opportunity to stand trial. And uh, as, as you can see from the, the sort of material, physical, evidentiary points that have been made, he'd have stood a good chance of acquitting himself. So if Ruby doesn't move in that uh, jailhouse, uh, the Sunday morning afterwards and get rid of uh, Oswald, then uh, the whole uh, conspiracy need, is going to collapse at that point. So therefore, it's important to know uh, at least a couple of basic things about Ruby. One is that he was by no means another lone nut of the Dealey Plaza story, as the government wanted to make out. This guy was connected with organized crime from the time he was a teenager in Chicago. And what he was up to he, in, in uh, Dallas is that he was there to represent the Sam Giancana interests, which were moving into the American Southwest. It's, it's impossible to believe that a guy like Ruby could have been motivated by some errant impulse on the spur of the moment to kill this guy Oswald. Second point, just very quickly, is that once he was in custody, uh, Ruby himself insisted on being interviewed by the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission didn't want to have anything to do with him. Warren just wanted to shut this thing down and get it over as fast as possible. But Ruby became virtually frantic in his efforts to get the Warren Commission down to Dallas to talk to him. And what he said when he finally got the interview was, I can't talk here. Get me out of Dallas. Take me to Washington. There is much that I can tell you about what happened here. And Warren turns a cold shoulder on him and says, well, Mr. Ruby, I don't know why you can't tell us here. And, since, and then Ruby said, well, listen, Warren, you're finished, you're through, you're another sucker like the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Warren, what, what, if I may add, uh, what Earl Warren said to him was, Jack, if you feel you're in any danger, we can terminate this interview at any time. Uh, that's not someone who's trying to find an answer. That's someone who's trying to cover up. Mm -hmm. We know now, what we didn't know then, is that a man named uh, Billy Grammer, who was manning the phones overnight, received a call from Jack Ruby the night before the shooting of Oswald. And he said, uh, if you move Oswald the way you're planning to, we will kill him. Now, why would Ruby inform them that he was going to do this? He'd want the element of surprise. In fact, what seems to have happened was that Ruby did everything in his power to prevent himself from having to do it. It seems as if he was ordered to. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, my question is, um, how, how uh, do you think the foreknowledge of the assassination went in the government? If, and, and if I might, Mr. Anson has something in his article about a comment uh, LBJ supposedly made to his mistress. Mm -hmm. This uh, has been reported. Uh, it's been alleged that uh, President Johnson said uh, uh, the day before the assassination when he was meeting with his, his mistress in Texas. There's no doubt that he had a mistress in Texas, and it's been documented who she is, and everyone knows who she is from Lady Bird Johnson on down. 
And he was supposed to have said to her, allegedly, after tomorrow, I won't have to worry about those Kennedy boys anymore. I find that, frankly, hard to believe. Uh, Lyndon Johnson may have been many things, but stupid, I don't think, was one of them. Uh, and I, I find it really inconceivable that he, that he would have made a statement like that. And I would prefer to believe that uh, President Johnson had no foreknowledge of what was going to go on in Dallas. But then wh who do you think did have foreknowledge? Who, wh where does this thing come to rest? Where does the rubber meet the road in, in this issue? Well, one of the unfortunate things here is that it shouldn't be uh, up to buffs um, who are, you know, to spend their entire lives, and God bless them uh, for doing this kind of stuff. The federal government should be investigating this, this crime, and the press, of which I am a member, an establishment member of the press, should be going at this hammer and tong. The fact of the matter is that public opinion polls show that 88% of the American people don't believe in the Warren Commission. Unfortunately, the 12% that does either seems to work for the New York Times or the federal government. There, is, there has never been a systematic, ongoing investigation by the press. And I th that's inexcusable on our part, and I think there are good reasons for it. I don't think there are conspiratorial reasons. But if we, we could get to the bottom of what's going on, if we began to investigate this like we would uh, investigate petty corruption at a county level. But you know, everybody, just briefly, everybody who has really tried to get into this thing and who've been, a been able to bring it all before an official, into an official forum, and, and I would say a word here for Jim Garrison, has been uh, knocked upside the head and basically told, sit down and shut up. So I think people come very early to understand that this is a very delicate issue with the government. And if you mess with it too long and too persistently and, and show any chance of finding some real concrete evidence and bringing a case against somebody, you're going to run into trouble. I can add to that. I'm the only person that I'm aware of who testified before the Rockefeller Commission, the Senate Intelligence Committee, and the House Assassinations Committee. And I saw the cover-up happen from the inside in all three. I actually was staff photographic consultant to the House Assassinations Committee and uh, testified before them. The chief counsel, the acting chief counsel uh, of the House Assassinations Committee called me into his office one day and told me that we had all been right, that the conspiracy went, and this is to answer your question, went to the highest levels of government and they were going to blow it out of the water. A few weeks later, he was out of a job and was replaced by somebody else. All right, yes, sir. I think Mr. Anson has probably touched on an answer to my question, but where were the, Wood, uh, the Woodwards and Bernsteins of their day in terms of investigative journalists who would, who would be totally outraged enough to uh, well, investigate I, the way that Watergate was investigated? And where are they now? And where, <laughs> yeah, why are we all just furious about this and <laughs> demanding answers? For, first of all, uh, this is an, an unbelievably complex story. The Warren Commission alone just uh, generated nearly a million pages of, uh, of testimony and evidence. There are very few no news organizations that, that have the resources to, to get through that morass. Secondly, um, there have dealing with buffs and people who are interested in the assassination is not always easy. You get, hear some really wild theories. And here I would make a word about Jim Garrison as well. And Carl and I take opposite views of the utility of Garrison. There were a lot of reporters who were burned by the Garrison investigation, did not want to have anything to do anymore with conspiracy. And frankly, uh, reporters, uh, by and large, are middle-class, straight-thinking people who've got their sources and they want to protect them. And uh, when they run into a conspiracy, at least at the presidential level, they have an impossible time thinking about this. When they run into a conspiracy because somebody's bribing a county judge, there's no problem at all thinking about that. There, the fact of the matter is that it hasn't been done, and there's no sign that it's going to be done by the press anytime soon. And I think that's something that, as a journalist, I feel ashamed of. Are there sealed documents that uh, yes. could be made oh, available? Yes. That, yes, uh, there's a trove of documents from the Warren Commission time, sealed until the year, the year 2039, I think. Why? Uh, well, the, the question is why. Everybody should speculate about that. Uh, President Bush could unseal that uh, treasure trove of documents with a stroke of the pen. This Assassinations Committee in the Congress, which in 77 uh, announced its intentions to let the sun shine in on all the evidence, wound up classifying a good deal of it, too, including a, a very fascinating report by a guy named Edwin Lopez, who looked into the uh, Mexico City stuff and came up with the conclusion that Oswald was being impersonated in Mexico City just a few weeks before the assassination. This has been classified. Very quickly, yes or no, are there people still in government today who are privy to the conspiracy? Oh, sure. Yes. Absolutely. No question about it. I think more or less retired. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. they're, if they're alive, they're around, but they're not, I don't think they're I think there's still people there. Um, 
President Bush, for instance, uh, when he was uh, working as in, in the CIA for all those years, during the time of the House Assassinations Committee, uh, he had the power to release everything they had, and so much was still withheld. Okay. So much was still. Oh, wait a second. I don't know. Maybe good institutional reasons for doing that. It doesn't well, mean he's yes, part of the again, conspiracy. We, we, we may not hear them though. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've got to take another commercial break. We'll be back. Guests of the Ron Reagan Show stay at the world-famous Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. For superb accommodations, the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Music Express, voted number one by the National Limousine Association. For your corporate limousine needs anywhere in the U.S. and the world, Music Express. For a printed transcript of this program, send $5 to Ron Reagan Transcripts, Journal Graphics, 1535 Grand Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203. To order by credit card, call 303-831-9000. Brush and fax service are available. You see it. We are just about out of time. I would like to thank my guests, Robert Sam Anson, David Lifton, Carl Oglesby, and Robert Groden. Thank you all very much for being here. Some people ask the question, why are we still, 30 years later, so interested in this case? The answer to me is very simple and very compelling. If it could happen then, it could happen now. If it could happen to JFK, it could happen to anyone. And until we find out who conspired to kill the president and why, we don't live in a true democracy. Good night.